Well, our scripture lesson today is found in the book of Luke, and it's the 10th chapter, the 1st through 11th, and then the 16th through 20th verses. Luke 10, 1 through 11, and then 16 through 20. After these things, the Lord commissioned 72 others and sent them on ahead in pairs to every city and place he was about to go. He said to them, the harvest is bigger than you can imagine, but there are few workers. Therefore, lead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. Plead with the Lord, I'm sorry. To send out workers for the harvest. Go. Be warned, though. I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Carry no wallet, no bag, and no sandals. Don't even greet anyone along the way. Whenever you enter a house, first say, May peace be on this house. If anyone there shares God's peace, then your peace will rest upon that person. If not, your blessing will return to you. Remain in this house, eating and drinking whatever they set before you, for the workers deserve their pay. Don't move from house to house. Whenever you enter a city and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, God's kingdom has come upon you. Whenever you enter a city and the people don't welcome you, go out into the street and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of your city that is collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come to you. And now the 16th through 20th verses. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. Whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned joyously saying, even the demons submit themselves to us in your name. Jesus replied, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority to crush snakes and scorpions underfoot. I have given you authority all over over all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice because the spirits submit to you. Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you this day. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago on Pentecost, we talked about how the Holy Spirit empowers us and how we will respond to God's call. Now, I reminded you that as we look forward to the future together, that Pentecost doesn't just have to be an historic date on the calendar. We can live Pentecost every day of our lives. Now today I would like you to think of an old commercial. Remember that old peppermint patty commercial? York peppermint patty commercial? The one that says, you know, when you bite into a York peppermint patty, I get the sensation that, and there's usually some crazy person half-dressed jumping off of an iceberg or something. Well today I want to adapt this phrase just a little bit and change it for our purposes. I would like you to think about the Holy Spirit in this way. When I think about the Holy Spirit, I get the sensation that dot, 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 and you fill in the blank. What, where, and when will our next Pentecost be? Where might we as a community of faith respond to God's call? Empowered by the Holy Spirit, respond in faith to the call issued by God through the needs of our neighbors and our community. And now I'm going to challenge you just a bit. I want you to think about what do you want this church to be? How do you want to best express the mission to the community through our faith? This Sunday, we begin our second year together. We've celebrated good news in the last year, cried and mourned over last, uh, lost loved ones that we, didn't, that we didn't plan on losing, and we worked together to ensure that the needy in the community are well taken care of. These questions that I'm asking you are important, and I want you to think about them seriously. Has God spoken to you and brought to your mind ideas of 
how we can better serve the community in a way that we perhaps aren't serving them. Ways that challenge us and yet fulfill us in our call as Christians. These aren't hypothetical questions. Answering these questions will help guide us and determine the future of this church. Now, I'm not scolding you or anything along those lines in this message, but I do believe that it is not only important to the life of Clinchfield, but to Christianity as a whole. We must take a serious look at our service to others in devotion to Jesus and our commitment to him. Back in the eighth chapter of Matthew, three different men are all wanting to follow Jesus, and they encounter Christ. And in return, he finds each of them lacking. The first young man Jesus encountered on the road to Jerusalem said he'd follow Jesus anywhere. But we were left with the impression that upon realizing he would be giving up all the comforts of home and hearth, the man determined following Jesus was not for him. The second man the Messiah encountered sought permission to remain home to bury his dead father which we came to understand meant that he didn't want to follow Jesus until he had no one left at home to live with. Once his father died, he willingly take his place in the midst of the disciples. And finally, the third man told Jesus that he'd follow him, but quickly qualified that statement by saying he first had to go home and say goodbye to his loved ones. And Jesus told him, no one who puts a hand on the plow looks back and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus reminded us that a, a call upon our lives means that immediate sacrifices must certainly be made. Now, some of you may know that I'm addicted to a TV show. Now, it was on A&E and it's still on in reruns. It's Duck Dynasty, I have to admit. I don't look like an, a redneck, but I'm a redneck <coughs> wannabe. I truly am. I'd love to try duck hunting or maybe deer hunting and been working on learning how to fish. Don't get me wrong, I can fish at the beach, but you give me all those lures here, forget it. What the heck is so intriguing to all of us about a back of a bunch of backwater rednecks from Louisiana? I mean, they look like they're something from the Stone Age with their big beards dressed in camouflage with their long hair and their long beards. I'll also admit that sometimes I considered, uh, I'm considered a joiner of the next big thing. But after being urged by my daughter to watch this show, I was quickly drawn into the family's faith values. There was no cussing on the show if you've never watched it. A lot of humor, most of it was clean. And each and every show ended with the family sitting around the table for dinner. And it was at that time that the patriarch of the family, Phil Robertson, affectionately known as the Duck Commander, gives thanks to God for the blessings placed before them on the table and in their lives. Now, skeptics said that was all good shtick, that the Robertsons have fallen on something to draw the religious community into the show. But if you scour the internet, you quickly find a faith that is deep and true of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Each Robertson son shares a message of Christ, of what he has done for him or them in their lives. Their oldest son, Alan, is a full-time preacher. And now Sadie, the daughter, is out on tour praising God and sharing her faith. In his book, Happy, 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 Phil Robertson writes about his decision to follow Jesus after a life of heavy drinking and, quote, romping and stomping. He and his wife, Kay, were heading up for a divorce, and his four young boys were about to be without a father if it weren't for God's intervention in Phil's life. He had decided to leave Kay and the boys, but after three months, Phil returned to Kay seeking what she had, a deep and abiding faith in God. Kay told him that he couldn't do it alone any longer. After meeting with Kay's preacher, the Reverend Bill Smith, Phil determined that Kay was right. He and Reverend Smith agreed to meet the following night at the church to discuss his walk with God some more. 
The following day, Kay returned from the grocery shopping with the boys to find a note to meet Phil at the church. Upon arriving, she found Phil couldn't wait any longer and found him already in the baptistry. The pastor had taken Phil's confession and was in the process of baptizing him. Phil was 28 years old and starting his life over. He wrote, once I make a decision, I'm all in and there's no second guessing. After I was baptized, I attended regular church services three times a week, twice on Sunday. I also attended, I also studied the Bible with someone or a group five nights a week. I felt like I needed time with Christian people to get me back on my feet spiritually. So I did that for about two years. After his former drinking buddies finally tracked him down, a resolute Phil would not turn back to his former ways. I told them, never come back. It was about five years after I was baptized before the pull of sin finally stopped. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the rest of the story, Phil designed duck calls and turned his passion into a multi-million dollar business. But he and his family have never lost their religious footing. They are all grounded in Christ. In this week's gospel lesson, Jesus takes his willing workers, 72 of them in all, and sends them out two by two into the land ahead of him as he and his disciples make their way to Jerusalem. These were not people concerned with their past lives, but instead they were all in, as Phil Robertson put it. Jesus knew that there was a lot of work to be done, more than 72 people could possibly handle. The harvest is bigger than you can imagine, Jesus said, but there are few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers for his harvest. And Jesus knew that these hand-picked followers would not only succeed in reaching people for God, but they would in turn make more disciples to continue his work. This was their on-the-job training, an internship of sorts, while Jesus was still with them. He warned them before sending them out that they were, what they were getting into. They would, they would be sheep among wolves. Now I wonder if that's what sometimes stops us from becoming what we could truly be. Are we fearful of being sheep among the wolves? Afraid that what we don't know about God will leave us somehow lacking. Or fearful that our lives may be put at stake by professing the gospel in neighborhoods that may be less than desirable. Perhaps that's exactly where we need to be, bringing Jesus' word of hope to the hopeless. But notice something. Jesus doesn't send them out alone. He sends them out in pairs. Perhaps it's just not for the sake of safety that he sends them out this way. Perhaps Jesus knows that in the face of persecution or rejection, that it takes two to bring in the message. When one gets discouraged, the other one is there to encourage them or pick them up and keep them focused on the task at hand. These workers were to travel light. They weren't to pick up the sturdiest American tourist or luggage and drag it with them down the dusty roads from town to town. They were to leave with basically the clothes on their backs. Carry no wallet, no bag, no sandals. Don't even greet anyone along the way. Jesus expects them to live and be focused on the mission. One of the things I also learned by reading Phil Robertson's book is the simplicity of the life that he led. <coughs> he grew up on a farm where he hunted for his meals, grew his own vegetables. People understood what you had to do to keep yourself grounded, and if you didn't work hard, you didn't eat. As you watch Duck Dynasty, you see Phil as he tries to bestow some of that wisdom onto his young grandchildren, often forcing them to accompany them, him on hunting or fishing trips, always leaving their cell phones behind. In essence, that's what Jesus was telling them in his day. Don't bring your money. No need for dice or cards. No Game Boys or iPods. Not even your iPhones or Android devices. Leave them all behind. You can bring your electronic devices with you, but before we head into the buildings, 
We're going to collect them. That's the covenant of spiritus that we were going to go to this summer. Why? Because like Jesus reminds his workers, we are about to we are about the work of Christ, focusing solely on his message. Don't worry, you will survive, all of you. Trust me. Next, Jesus tells the 72 that if they enter a house with peace be to this house and their message is accepted, if a son of peace is there, meaning someone longing to hear and accept God's message, then God's peace will rest there. If not, God's peace will not remain with, with them, but leave when the messenger leaves. Moreover, the envoys are to remain in the same house as long as they're in town, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. In other words, Jesus doesn't want them moving from house to house because Miss K's food is better than Miss Paula's. Yet stay in that one house. Jesus once received a not so favorable reply when he sent two of his disciples ahead into a Samaritan town. In fact, they didn't want him there at all. In preparing his new workers, Jesus tells them what they are to do when they enter either a favorable town or one that's not so happy to accept them. Whenever you enter a city and its people welcome you, eat what they set before you. Heal the sick who are there and say to them, God's kingdom has come upon you. And whenever you enter a city and the people don't welcome you, go out into the streets and say, as a complaint against you, we brush off the dust of your city that is collected on our feet. But know this, God's kingdom has come to you. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus didn't want his workers to worry about the outcome of their preaching and teaching. He just wanted willing workers to plant the seeds. The people weren't there to judge their effectiveness as witnesses for Jesus. And that is true of our discipleship today. Our fear of rejection, our fear of failure, oftentimes stifles our ability to head out into the mission field. We simply cannot let that stop us from sharing the message with others. You may have heard a report in the last few years about the nuns. The nuns are the fastest growing religious group in the United States today. Now, they're not talking about the ladies that wear the funny little hats upon their heads. They mean the N-O-N-E-S's, the nuns. People who refused to equate themselves with any religious beliefs or organizations. Church attendance is down, especially among young people. The harvest is plentiful as, as true today as it was in Jesus' time. Again, we're not to worry about our successes in the harvest. Jesus tells us only what we should do and doesn't say anything about measuring our success. If people don't accept your message, he says, shake the dust off your feet and move on. If we have done our best at presenting the gospel to others, then we have done exactly what Jesus asked. Regardless, we have told them God's kingdom has come to you. If they choose to believe you or not, that is not to be our concern. Our job is the present to present the information, to plant the seed. It's God's job to make it grow. Then Jesus points out that those workers, to those workers, that those unwilling to welcome God's kingdom are not only rejecting their message, but Jesus as well. Whomever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. And whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. Luke's gospel then tells us that the 72 went out on their mission and returned with stories of mighty success. Even demons submitted themselves to them in Jesus' name, they said. As Phil Robertson would say, that made Jesus happy, happy, happy. Jesus responded by saying, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning, which is akin to Phil's other favorite saying, now we're cooking with peanut oil. In other words, Jesus saw Satan being driven from his high and lofty places by the work of the 72. 
But Jesus quickly reminds them that though he has given them authority to crush snakes and scorpions underfoot and authority over all the power of the enemy, that they are not to let the success go to their heads. Do not rejoice because the spirits submit to you. Rejoice instead that your names are written in heaven, he reminds them. Like Duck Dynasty's Robertson clan, Jesus wants us to remain grounded and not let our successes go to our heads. When we reach out in faith to help others, we succeed. It is not because of our own efforts, but the work of the Lord through us. Oftentimes when we fail, it is because we have forgotten to listen to the instructions and learn our lessons before we set out without the proper training or guidance. Phil Robertson was not an overnight success. He tried for 28 years to do things his way. And he found, uh, found out that he almost lost everything by trusting in himself. He had fought so hard to create this world. And it was all paper. It was only after he gave his life to the Lord and solely began relying on him that things came together for him. So I return to those questions I keep asking you. Are you content where you are at your church? Are we like the three men that Jesus found lacking and afraid to fail? Or are we willing to take up the Lord's instruction to move forward in the knowledge that succeeding or failing is not something we need to be concerned with? It is the effort that is important. All Jesus wants is willing workers. He sent out 72 in Luke's gospel message today, and they touched the lives of many. Imagine what we could do if we took the 50 or so members of this church that are here most every Sunday, relying fully on Jesus, set out on our mission together. I challenge all of us to stretch beyond our comfort zones and take a chance by reaching out to this neighborhood Stepping out in faith to reach those who may not know the name of Jesus. I challenge you to find the nuns out there. And invite them into a relationship with Christ. We may not have the same success as Kay Robertson had in bringing Phil back to the fold. But yet we just met. Remember, it's not all up to us. It is up to our sheep commander, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.